definitely muted. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma faqihna fi al-deen wa alimna al-ta'wil wa alhimna bi fayd fadlika rushdana ya Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, welcome to our class on understanding the most beautiful names of Allah Most High. And today we're going to be looking at the divine name Allah. So we opened in the first class by looking at the meanings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having divine names. And that each name is a meaning that is possessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So knowing the divine names is a means of increasing in faith because each name is light. But light, what is it? When we talk about light, Imam Zarruq tells us that light is a meaning of faith that is imprinted in the heart, that gives it clarity. Light is a meaning of faith that is imprinted in the heart that gives, the, that gives it clarity. And that's why light shows you things as they are. If things are dark, you cannot see. And the very purpose of faith is to see correctly, is to behold, to behold reality as it truly is. So today, bismillahi ta'ala, First, we're going to do a quick recap regarding the significance of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that Allah la ilaha illa hu lahu al asma'ul husna. Allah, there is no God but Him. His are the most beautiful names. His are the most beautiful names. Right? So every name points to the one name. Right? Every name points to the one named. And we're not mentioning in reality the names of Allah. We are mentioning Allah Himself. Right? Because the name points to the one named. Right? But if you think about it, if you say Allah, right? there are four levels of people. There are the disbelievers who don't recognize what is Allah. Right? So they mention the word, but they deny the meaning. That's the kafir. They deny the meaning of it, the reality of it. But the believer affirms the meaning that Allah is the true God. He is the one worthy of war, etc. But the conscious believer, when they say Allah, they have awareness of the one they're naming. So they say Bismillah. And they that makes them think about Allah. For example. So they have you know, the, the believer who simply knows it, but they don't think about it. Then there's a believer who has consciousness. But then the, there's a believer who is conscious of Allah, and then they mention the name of Allah. And that's how the believer is supposed to be. So the disbeliever doesn't affirm the meaning. The believer affirms the meaning. That yes, I affirm that there is a God he is, he is Allah. But the conscious b believer, right, when they mention Allah, they, rem the, they mention, they say subhanallah. And they say it and then they think of the meaning. The meaning they affirmed. But by mentioning the meaning, by mentioning the word, they reflect on the meaning. It points them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the believer who's realizing their faith would be conscious first. And then they would say, subhanallah, 
not because they want to glorify Allah, but because they are already in a state of glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His are the most beautiful names, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us, قُلِ ادْعُوا اللَّهَ أَوِ ادْعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ Say, call on Allah or call on the All-Merciful. فَأَيَّمَّا تَدْعُوا فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى By whatever name you call on him, his are the most beautiful names from the 17th surah, verse 110. أَيَّمَّا تَدْعُوا Whichever name you call upon him by, why? Because you're not calling... You're not just mentioning the names. It's the one named. So if we listen, for example, to, you know, there's different compilations of the Asma'illah al-Husna. People say them in different ways. And classically, those scholars wrote poetry of calling upon Allah by His 99 names and even some of the contemporary ulama did so to facilitate this. But you're not just saying those words. And that is the purpose of knowledge. It's to go from forms to realities. And to go from forms to realities. That when we say, Hu Allahu alladhi la ilaha illahu ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, al-Malik al-Quddus, etc., etc., etc. These are not just words that one is saying. But even when one knows it, these are words and they're talking about Allah. That too is good. And that simple faith has benefit. Why? Because when we do that, we do it because we love. We do it because we have respect. We have reverence. And sometimes that simple faith has great merit in it as well. And we looked briefly, just to recap briefly, who is God? Right? The one worthy of worship. That is the meaning of ilah. The one worthy of worship. The necessary existent. Afillahi shak. Is there doubt about God? Can there be doubt about God? He is the one alone who is the creator and sustainer. Allah Samad. Allah is the one who is independent, whom all depend upon. He is the one free of need of any other, whom all are in absolute need of. Now, how do we know one who is so great and glorious? We know him through his most beautiful names. That is the mercy that, and the gift that we have. A friend of mine used to take people from different faith traditions camping once a year. And what they would do is they would say, okay, let's discuss together how we reflect on God. And it would be a guided discussion. One of the amazing things about our, about our religion is that there is no conception of God that tells us as much about God as we have. But it fits together. It is coherent. It is comprehensive. And that is a tremendous gift that we have. Right? So, how do we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these names? That's what we see. How do we call upon Allah by His names? Right? There are five duties that we looked at. First is know the names. Know the names and know their meanings. But the names are not a superficial matter. Right? Sometimes people, you know, we reduce religion down to gross simplifications, which in, in a sense don't make any sense. Why? They say, well, Allah is, you know, the, for example, you say, Ar-Rahman is the most merciful. So what does that mean? Well, He has mercy. And what is Ar-Rahim? He is the, com the most compassionate. But what does that mean? And that's like saying, well, I know what Rome is. Rome is in Italy. Okay, that's, that's better than, you know, there's, there's Romes in the U.S., for example, right? There's many Romes in the U.S., but that doesn't tell you much. Right? Tell me about it. Right? 
Now, Allah is worth knowing. Right? So we need to go b beyond this superficiality, right? And that's also, you know, we have this seminar on beholding the Quran and the same meaning would apply there, right? That the Prophet Sallallahu tells us, whomever Allah wishes well for, he grants deep understanding of the religion. So that's something we should commit to, that we want to understand. And the understanding is by learning and by reflection. So we want to know these names. We want to know these names and to keep increasing in our knowledge of these names and our reflection on these names. There is a noted Turkish calligrapher. His name is Mehmed Osjai. Um, a friend of mine and I visited him um, in the year 2000. And he was working on a calligraphic piece about a particular divine name. He said for the last month, and he's a, he's a alim as well. He's a graduate of Sharia and, um, you know, and a fascinating person. You know, he's gr grown up connected with people of knowledge, etc. So he said, I've been reflecting on this name because I can't truly convey you know, this name in writing unless I really appreciate what it means. Unless I appreciate what it means. And any artist would understand that you know, if you want to really convey even a picture of somebody, you want to capture who they are. Right? It's not just a snapshot. That's the difference between, so, you know, Yasir Bhai and I, we take a snapshot, we just say, please smile. And like a real artist who can tries to capture the person. Right? Now Allah is beyond encompassing. Allah is beyond encompassing. But what do we understand? So this is an, an important life journey. But knowing the name is one component of that. Second, how do you turn to Allah through this name? How do you turn to Allah through this name? This is called ta'alluq. How do you attach yourself to Allah by realizing this meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ta'alluq. And this is very important. Right? It's very important. Because the names are ways by which we can strengthen our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa the third is being characterized by its quality. Right? What does it mean to be a servant of the one who has this name? The fourth is to be realized in its spiritual implications. Right? Each name has consequences. Right? Each name has consequences. If you realize that this is how Allah is, what should be the state of your heart when you realize that meaning. Right? And that is often you know, referred to as tahakkuk. And the fifth is to, to make a practice of calling upon Allah by this particular name. And this is a sign of a healthy or comprehensive relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah has these names and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. That whichever name you call upon him by, his are the most beautiful names. So you want a full relationship with Allah, you should be turning to Allah by those names. Because the reality of dua is not demands on the divine. Allah Most High does not need you to remind him about anything. Including what you need. You don't need to remind him, oh Allah, please keep me alive. Uh, please make my heart beat. Please um, make my lungs handle the oxygen correctly. Please make all the you know, critical variables in my body stay in balance. Please keep my blood sugar, you know, all, the, all the things going on. He's sustaining you com comprehensively at every time. All that's happening to you and around you and coming to you is all by the will and power of Allah, eternally. So you don't need to remind him. Dua truly is an expression of your slavehood to Allah and your recognition of who you are 
as a needy servant and who Allah is as your Lord. So part of healthy dua that goes beyond just the shopping list dua. And the shopping list dua is also beloved to Allah because He is the fulfiller of all needs. So you raise your needs to Allah. That's good. Your dunya we need. That's from seeking the good of this life. But there's more to your reality than this life. What about the good of the next? What about the good of the next? You raise that too to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? By dua. What about your relationship with Allah Himself? Your relationship with Allah Himself. That's where making dua of your own words right? by these names and, and not you can't go from well I just say you know I just don't I don't make any dua but that's how you build your capacity to dua the Prophet ﷺ mentioned Allah loves those who are insistent in their dua and, and insistence in dua is either that you ask Allah for all things or that you repeat the dua that you make. Or you make comprehensive duas. You make comprehensive duas. So these divine names are, you know, this is a life journey. It's not something you learn, say, okay, I study the 99 names. This is something that is, should be a deep part of your devotional practice. A deep part of your devotional practice should also be a deep part of your reflection. And one of the practical ways to do it is, as you learn about particular names, etc., spend some time making dua. Right? Right? With thinking about these various things that we look at. So in this class, you know, we are looking to increase our faith and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because knowing the name is knowing the one named. Secondly, to inculcate the qualities of faith. The third is to inculcate good character. Right? And it's come regarding that. Right? That characterize yourself with the divine qualities. Characterize yourself with the divine traits. Meaning the qualities of being a servant of the one who has those traits. Right? So if Allah is Al-Qawi, the strong you're called upon to be strong as a believer. But how? The strength that befits a servant of the, the strong. Right? Not the strength of arrogance, of wrongdoing, but the strength of being able to pursue what is pleasing to Allah, of the, of the good of this life and the next. Right? That strength of resolve strength of commitment, strength in your consistency, strength in your concern, and so on. And to be clear, and we want to use this as a means to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll be looking at something of the prophetic perfections, because each of these qualities is of the qualities of our beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Right? He, is, he is the Abdullah, he is Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahim, he is the perfect servant. And we mentioned some of the sources that this um, class is based on of the, the main classical works. So today we're going to look at the divine name Allah. Right? The divine name Allah. Now this name is, as Imam Zarruq puts it, هذا الاسم, he says, this name encompasses the meanings of all the divine names. This name encompasses the meanings of all the divine names. Right? And one of the investigations related to this is that the ulama were bewildered by the name as they were bewildered by the, the, you know, the, the scholars were bewildered by the name of God as they were bewildered by the reality of God. So they differed regarding this name, as we will see. So the divine name, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is 
the Ismullah al-Azam. This is the greatest name of Allah. The Prophet sallallahu tells us that Allah Most High has a name that is the greatest name, which if he is called upon by, he will respond. And there are many interpretations of what is the greatest name of Allah. Because the Prophet ﷺ, out of great divine wisdom, did not just spell it out, which is the greatest name of Allah. So a lot of people are reduction. Of course, the greatest name of Allah is Allah. There are at least the major opinions on what is the greatest name of Allah are 41 major opinions. There's a great 20th century scholar from Lahore, Mulan Ruhani al-Bazi. He wrote a work in over 400 pages on what is the greatest name of, of Allah. Because there's many discussions related to it. Amongst the interpretations that it isn't the, the name Allah, is that it is Al-Hayyul Qayyum, the living, the all-sustaining. Why? Because of where it's mentioned in the Qur'an, in Ayatul Kursi, and other reasons. Because it tells us the, you know, the distinct qualities of God. There's other interpretations as well about what is the greatest name of Allah. Some said that the greatest name of Allah is when you call upon Allah in word and meaning. And there's a case for that as well. The greatest name of Allah is when you call upon Allah, not just in word, but in meaning, regardless of which name you call upon Allah by. You know, a lot of people, for example, when there's times of distress, etc., they'll recite Ya Latif, asking Allah for his lutf. They say Ya Latif, Ya Latif. So why are you reciting this? Because I'm in distress. That's like the person you know, who's knocking on the door. So why are you knocking on the door? I was told to knock on the door. He said, but why were you knocking? He said, oh, because um, that brother over there, he, he, uh, behind the door, he could help me. But you're not really aware of, you're not really aware of why you are calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And very often, that is how we call upon Allah. Not just when we say, Ya Allah, for example, etc. Or even when we make du'as. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً O Lord, grant us the good of this life. وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً What is the greatest part of that supplication that we recite? رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً O Lord, grant us the good of this life and the good of the next. What's the greatest part of that du'a? Hmm? No. D yeah. No, the greatest thing in the in the dua, what is it? Rabbana, right? Right? Oh our Lord. Right? Technically, if you know if we were if we were people of deep reflection, we wouldn't have to say anything beyond. You are our caring, nurturing Lord. Khalas. That should fill you with faith, with certitude, with reliance, with trust, with hope, with confidence, but also with fear and awe that He's our Lord. And if you know Him both in His mercy, but also in His majesty, you know that life is serious. There's things I have to do. So I'm going to seek them. Life has consequence, so I'll seek the next life. Like really, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا is all this a consequence of Allah being our caring Lord. That's why one of the modes of making dua is just to say, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, O Lord, O Lord. As we know from the hadith of Allah is pure and accepts nothing but the pure. Allah, illa and, the, and it mentions about the man on a long journey, a dirty and disheveled and distressed. Who calls upon Allah, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb. Why? Because when you're, what is the reality of dua? Is expression of need 
and recognition of who Allah is. Dua is, the Prophet ﷺ said, devotion. Dua is Iman. And then if you have certitude, you know that He will give you what you seek. Because what you seek is not you know, the, the Tesla and a bigger Tesla and whatever else. Right? What you need is what will ultimately benefit you. And what you really need is what will ultimately benefit you. So, so some said that it, the greatest name is to call upon Allah in word and meaning. Others said that the, the greatest name of Allah is when you say, when you mention Allah present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what's mentioned by Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jailani. He was asked that what is the greatest name of Allah? He said, It is Allah on condition that you mention Allah's name. And you have nothing in your heart but Allah. Right? That is the greatest name of Allah. But the ulama say, just as amongst the divine names, the greatest name of Allah is Allah. Because of this reality that it is the encompassing name and it is the personal name of Allah. All the other names are names that highlight particular qualities of Allah. Right? That, that highlight particular qualities of Allah. But the name Allah refers to Allah Himself and it encompasses all the other qualities. As is clear from within the from within the Quran itself. So it's the most comprehensive of the divine names. But one of the discussions regarding the name of Allah, knowing the name in the Arabic language, is the word Allah derived or not? So some of the scholars say that Allah is from Al-Ilah, the God. And some scholars held this. Some scholars held this, that it is derived, that this is the formal name, the God. Right? And they had their arguments for it, etc. But it does not really work fully both grammatically in terms of derivation and it doesn't really work fully in terms of reality for a number of reasons. Amongst the reasons it doesn't work in reality is that the names of Allah are eternal and languages aren't eternal. Right? So this name is not derived. Right? It is the personal name of Allah, it is not derived from Al-Ilah. Although its meaning is the God, but it is the personal name of God Himself. So it's, it's not derived, although there's some discussions on that. And you can recap what, what are the meanings of Al-Ilah. Now, the meaning of the divine name Allah, right? The scholars have many things to say about this. Imam Ahmad Zarruq, who's a great North African scholar, he said that the that some of the scholars said that Allah is the, the, the divine name Allah. Of course, it's the name for the, the one who alone is rightfully worthy of worship. Who is free of any need in any way whatsoever. Who is characterized by all qualities of divinity. By all the qualities of divinity. Right? And that is one of the ways that they have defined the, the name Allah. Right? Another way that they've described the name Allah is that Allah refers to God Himself. Right? It refers to God Himself, the entity of God. 
who is characterized by all eternal qualities and transcendent beyond all originated qualities. And this is very important, right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself tells us, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There is absolutely nothing like unto him. Right? There is absolutely nothing like unto him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there being absolutely nothing like unto him entails that Allah has all eternal qualities. And this is very important because when we talk about Allah, it's very important to appreciate that Allah himself is eternal beyond time. Everything we affirm or can affirm about Allah is eternal and absolute. Is eternal and absolute. Beyond limit. And eternity is not an eternity of time. Because and those of you who know maths and these kinds of things, right? there's two types of infinity. Right? One infinity would be a succession of numbers without discernible end. You can create an algorithm and this keeps generating more numbers. And this keeps going and going and going. But that is temporal or limited eternity or limited infinity. But Allah is absolutely eternal. He's absolutely eternal. He's in that He is beyond time and He is absolute in His qualities. He is not limited in any way whatsoever. So when we say God is great, doesn't mean He is greater than you and me, that we are this big and Allah is just really, 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 really big. No, He is beyond size, right? He is beyond size. Because just as time is created, all limits are created. All limits are created. So Allah is the one who is characterized by being absolutely distinct from the qualities of created things. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing whatsoever like unto him. That's why they said that if you reflect on who Allah is, that you realize that كُلُّ مَا خَطَرَ بِبَالِكْ فَاللَّهُ بِخِلَافِ ذَلِكْ Whatever occurs to your mind, Allah is absolutely distinct from that. Allah Most High is absolutely distinct from that. Because all that occurs to your mind is originated. All that occurs to your mind is originated. All that occurs to your mind is originated. Is limited. And Allah is eternal beyond time. And that has many, many implications, as we'll see. You know, we don't we think of Allah some, subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes in very limited ways. Will Allah hear my dua? First, firstly, of course, short sight, Allah hears all things. But is Allah waiting for you? Is Allah waiting for you? Time does not relate to him. Time does not relate to him. Past, present, and future, these relate to things that are created, that are originated. Allah being eternal does not mean that, you know, there's these created things and Allah is going along with them. He's like, you know, sometimes it's almost like we imagine God is the great coach. Some people actually talk about God like he's your life coach. Religion is divine life coaching. So you're playing the game, but he's on the sidelines. But God has the, you know, has the A-team, the prophets and others, sitting on the bench. Which if you think about that, then why are they sitting on the bench? Right? Like what are they being saved for? Right? That's not the case. And Allah is eternal. 
beyond time. And that's very important because when you call upon Allah, when does He give you? When does He give you? Hmm? Forget time. When? Where does the dua come from? Where does the dua come from? Where does the dua come from? Hmm? Yeah. So this is the majestically bewildering reality of God. If we look at how are you alive at this moment? How are you alive at this moment? Sorry? No, it's a real question. Sorry? That's only half the story because Allah brought us into existence. But, that's, but how are you alive at this moment right now? Yeah, because Allah is sustaining you at every moment. Right? Allah is sustaining you at every moment. But Allah is not sustaining you at every moment that He's not on the sidelines running around saying, okay, stay alive, stay alive, uh, sit down, stand up. No, He's not like the coach on the sidelines. Allah exists eternally beyond time. We can't, what, what does it mean to exist beyond time? Right? So Allah is the interaction with God is between an originated being, us, and the absolutely eternal. Right? And the absolutely eternal. And that's very important to know because that is related to our certitude. Right? That's related to our certitude. That when we call upon Allah, it's because Allah has chosen for us to call upon Him. And He's chosen, and He's promised that He, he answers. So He's chosen to to answer us. Now how? That is up to him. We don't know how it will be answered. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, inna min al lamuntaqimun, that truly we shall inf truly inflict complete vengeance on the criminals. When the Prophet tells us what will happen in the hereafter. That's not just that you need, if everything goes well, this is what's going to happen to the righteous. And this, this is, is Allah waiting for the day of judgment to happen? No. Past, present, and future are all the same for Allah. Allah is not bound by time. We are bound by time. We are bound by time. And it's important to appreciate that because we talk about Allah. He's not just the creator. Okay, he created. Okay, so what's he doing right now? Right. Right. Like there's this absurd discussion. Does God hear you? Right. Some faith traditions have these questions. Or is he a silent God? And we should be careful not to get stuck in other people's paradigms. To be stuck in other people's paradigms. Or to use their language. And yes, it's fancy language. They have big institutions, etc. Right? You know, they, you know, they bomb and build. <laughs> they bomb our lands and build theirs, right? And that doesn't mean that they're right. That a lot of that is, is stolen, right? Even the scholars now, you know, they're, you know, it's like one of the great American scholars, he's in, at the Vatican right now. So they have a whole book published in Arabic of the manuscripts that the Catholic Church stole from Muslim lands. And it's amazing because all classically all great manuscripts were made as endowments. So it's theft. So when they say, we didn't steal it, someone sold it to us. Right? But it says on it, waqf, an endowment. Right? That is like, you know, if, if someone named Yasir, not Yasir Bhai, some other Yasir, didn't want to steal. You know, one of the ways in the old days they, they, they wouldn't steal would be they send one person in to throw the item out of the house. And the other said, I just found it on the street. I picked it up. 
And then the scholars differed. Would that have the punishment of theft or not? Because okay. I didn't take it from the person's house. I was just walking by. I saw the sofa lying on the street. Because you, know, you throw it out of the house. <laughs> Similarly. So you have to be aware right, that, that who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? Who is Allah? He, that this is why this definition that he is the one who has none of the qualities of created things. What are your fundamental qualities? You are enveloped in time. Every moment, you know, every feeling that you have is a moment you're in in which you feel a certain way. Allah is not bound by any of that. He is the creator of time. Any quality you have is limited. Everything in creation, anything that you can talk about is limited. And it's dependent. And Allah is eternal beyond time. And he is absolute beyond limit. Absolute beyond limit. So when we talk about the mercy of Allah, how merciful is Allah? What is the mercy of Allah? It is absolute, beyond time, and eternal, beyond limit. That's who you deal with. That's who, you, who you're dealing with. That's very important. Any quality you can talk about Allah. What is the generosity of Allah? What is the power of Allah? What is the hearing of Allah? What is the knowledge of Allah? But we conceive, okay, Allah knows what I'm doing. But it's not, you know, keep the coach analogy. It's not like the coaching is, oh, so and so is tiring right now. Because how do you know? How do you know? There's something known, and then there's the act of knowing, then you know. So, for example, if my cup was empty. First, there's something knowable. Empty cup, it's not empty. Or the cup is half full. There's something knowable. Then there's the act of knowing. Then I know. But is Allah's knowledge like that? No. Allah's knowledge, like everything we affirm about Allah, is eternal and absolute. So Allah knows eternally. Absolutely. And it doesn't resemble the knowledge of created things. Allah knows things before they are. Because is, is he bound by time? We, we agree. He's not bound by time. It couldn't be otherwise. He's the necessary existent. Everything else only is there because he brought it into existence. Time relates to something that comes into existence. So that's who Allah is. That's who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. He is the one who is characterized by all attributes of perfection. Transcendent beyond all imperfection. Now Allah is characterized by all attributes of perfection. It's not that Allah's attributes are more than our attributes. But Allah's attributes are absolute, are eternal and absolute without limits. Limits are created. This also, of course, this understanding of God would make you appreciate that many ways that people think of God are absurd. That Allah smiles and He laughs and He st stretches His hand and He's pleased and displeased. And that's where, because what, did, what does being becoming pleased mean? Yeah, it entails there's change. There's change. And that's not what we mean by the pleasure of Allah. Because that is conceiving of God as the coach on the sideline, right? That, oh, he was doing fine, now he's slouching off. They say there's a Brazilian player, so good. Romario, that 
This opposition team claims that for 10 minutes, he was actually st sleeping standing up on the pitch. He had already scored several goals. Now, I don't know if that's true, but, you know, so someone's slacking off. So you're upset. Move. That's not how you conceive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And he's transcendent beyond all imperfections. Which is why this principle that all that occurs to minds, Allah is absolutely distinct from it. Allah is absolutely distinct from it. Allah Most High is absolutely distinct from it. He is the necessary existent who is absolutely free of all needs and all limits whom all are in absolute need of in every way. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why it's called the name of majesty. Lafzul Jalala. The name of majesty. Then he, then we see that, okay, how do we turn to Allah by this name? Right? How do we turn to Allah by the divine name Allah? Right? It is by sincerity. Right? It is by sincerity. What is sincerity? Ikhlas. Ikhlas comes from purity, from khulus. Right? If you have water that is pure, you call it ma'un khalis, pure water. In some countries, they claim to sell khalis dood. Right? And dood for you Arabs is not worms, dood. Right? And it's not referring to a dood, right? That he's a pure dude, but dude, pure milk. And pure milk, at least the claim is that it's free of any adulterations. There's milk and nothing else. Ikhlas, what's the most important ikhlas you have to have? most important sincerity what do we have to be sincere in that's another way of looking at it what do we have to be sincere in worship any other answer jazakumul uh, khair sincere in faith that's why there's a surah called Suratul Ikhlas, a chapter on purity or on sincerity. Why? Because sincerity is that you have only, that you purify something of any blemish, any imperfection, any ulterior reality. So we turn to Allah by the divine name Allah, firstly by making our faith sincere unto Him. That's the first. Right? Ikhlas, that we have purity of faith. What is purity of faith? Is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Ikhlas. And which is not accidental that we're called upon to repeat it when we wake up. One of the sunnahs of morning time is to repeat Surah Al-Ikhlas at Fajr time right, with the three quls. And to recite the three quls, the most important of which is Al-Ikhlas after every prayer, but particularly Fajr and Maghrib. To recite it before going to sleep. Because at the heart of it is the purity of faith. Now you say it devotionally, you'll get reward. But you say it meaningfully, Purposefully, it is meant to be transformative. It is meant to be transformative. So there's purity of faith, which is that you realize who is God. 
Who is God? Right? The purity of belief in God himself and purity of belief in his attributes and purity of belief in his actions, in his attributes that every attribute of perfection is Allah's. And that's a journey. It's a journey. That when we learn about these names, all these meanings are Allah's. He is the absolutely majestic. He is the absolutely worthy of being relied upon. He is the absolutely forgiving. Right? Now if you ask somebody, do you believe Allah is the all forgiving? Yeah. But then you just committed sin, you're wondering, will Allah forgive me? Did you seek his forgiveness? Yes. But do you believe the promise of Allah? Yes. Then what are you worried about? Right? What are you worried about? A lot of people who have waswasa, who have doubts in wudu. Have we not been told to follow the Prophet ﷺ? Yes. So if you do what the Prophet ﷺ says, is it not sufficient? Yes. In tuti'uhu tahtadu. If you follow him, you'll be guided. Allah promises. So being attached to Allah, regarding Allah himself, regarding his attributes, regarding his actions. What? That قُلْ كُلٌّ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Say it is all from Allah. هَذَا خَلْقُ اللَّهِ This is the creating of Allah. So, and that of course needs cultivation. To connect with Allah, to learn, to see things as being from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happened? Allah happened. Right? In the, the Prophet sallallahu demonstrated this in a beautiful manner. When... You know, Sayyidina Anna says, whenever I broke something and the Prophet some family members would object to him because he was a child. And if you're a child, you should learn the hadith of Sayyidina Anas. Right? Because you should, whenever your parents are upset, you should say, but the Prophet not got, never got upset with Sayyidina Anas. Right? You should remember that. Okay? okay. So anytime... Your parents got upset, but the Prophet ﷺ never got upset with Sayyidina Anas. Now don't say that to your grandfather about your uncle Anas. That's a separate matter. Um, so the, what would the Prophet ﷺ say? He said, let him be. Because ma kan, what was destined happened. Of course we hold people responsible, but ultimately... It is all from Allah. It could not have been otherwise. It's also empowering because if you know that, then okay, what do I do next? That's what counts. What do I do next? So we connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the name Allah, by turning to Him, by purifying our faith, number one. By purity of faith in Allah Himself, in His attributes, in His actions. Allah is the creator of everything. That doesn't mean that you don't take consequences into account. You live on the 18th floor, your kid decides to check whether your MacBook Air can really be airborne. So they threw it out of the window. Now if you consider, most of us would probably get upset with that. But would getting upset... Fix the MacBook Air. Hmm? If you got upset enough, there's a secret rewind button to time. That if you reach 25 units of anger, time will go back 25 seconds. And then your kid won't throw it. No, it's happened. Practically, you have to see what do you do next. Right? With respect to your laptop, go pick it up before a car runs over it too. And number two, what do you do in terms of your child? And also this is good for you because it's less stress-inducing than random venting. So this is empowering. So the most important way you connect to Allah by the divine name Allah, ta'alluq, is the cultivation of faith in Allah himself, purity of belief in Allah, purity of belief in his attributes, purity of belief in his actions. It is all from Allah. 
And then, of course, you respond as a servant. Okay, what do I do next? It does not preclude. You know, you might, you know. However, you know, you respond to the child, etc. And purity of belief in the command of Allah. Right? That what are the commands of the religion? They're Allah's commands. Simple as that. So if you know who you are, I'm a servant of Allah. What are you here to do to serve? You don't necessarily have to understand why. Right? You run a, a date company. You tell one of your employees, please drop off these dates over there. And you're in a, that's a, you walk, say, um, could you pl please explain why I have to drop them there? And why this number? Well, it's an instruction. Do your job. Okay? Now, when there's opportunity, you want to understand more. Right? Because, oh, that's a, an important client and so on. That might help you do your job better. But doing your job is not up for question. Right? Or shouldn't be up for question. Right? Now, you know, we are in a world of, you know, of upside down. But the basis is that you... Do what you're told. And being a servant entails that with respect to the command. Of course, you seek to understand the command to fulfill it more beautifully. So that is, those are four of the ways related to Iman. And then you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the divine name Allah, also by making your worship purely for the sake of Allah. By making your worship purely for the sake of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala address, addresses Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. قُلْ إِنَّنِي أَنَا اللَّهِ Say, indeed, I am God, Allah Most High says. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا There's no God but me. فَعْبُدْنِي So therefore worship me. What comes first is the faith reality. So therefore worship me. وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي And establish prayer out of my remembrance. That is... Establish prayer out of my remembrance. For my sake alone. Iyaka na'bud. It is you alone we are humbly devoted to. Okay? So that's part of connecting to Allah by these names. That whether it be in our prayer or anything else. What is dua? Let's say you were going to a job interview. And you were really early, but you saw that there was a, a new halal Italian restaurant and they're giving, you need some, some pasta for free. So you decided to eat pasta and you felt a little bad because you're having it standing. And you kind of squeezed on, on, the, on the thing they serve the pasta in and it went all over your white shirt. So now you're making dua because you, you now have half an hour to find a change of clothes. What is the subject of your dua? Okay. What is the subject of your dua? Or what should be the subject of your dua? Okay. No, the subject of your dua in reality is not your need. The subject of your dua is worship. Dua is worship. Who is the one worshipped? Allah. What is the subject of dua? What is the subject of dua? Allah. Not the worship of Allah. Allah Himself. Right? What is the subject of your prayer? Your sub, the subject of your prayer is not a set of actions that you do. Those you do and you do them precisely. We take the precision of our actions very seriously. The process of pray as you have seen me pray. But the subject of worship is Allah. Iyaka na'bud. It is you we are humbly devoted to. The humble devotion is because of Allah. So when we make dua, right, the context of the dua 
Right? Like the context of our Dhuhr prayer is that it is Dhuhr time. But why are we praying? Because it's Dhuhr? No. Because it's Allah. Okay? Allah, it is Allah that I'm praying Dhuhr for. That is sincerity. Okay? It is Allah that I'm making this dua. The spaghetti on my shirt just reminds me, is a, is a context of reminder of my neediness to Allah and of Allah being Allah. Okay. Whether I find a, find a replacement of, of the shirt, etc., Allah is not my butler. Right? That do this, do this, do this. No. We're expressing need and we know Allah is so generous, He'll, he'll fulfill the need. Maybe the answer to the dua was that job wasn't good for you. They're unethical. Or that you didn't get that job, so you started your own company. And ended up being good for you. Or whatever. It's, it's answered. Allah, that's sincerity of belief. Right? So, connecting to Allah, right? turning to Allah by the name of, of Allah, is to make all your devotion for His sake. You're, you have a parent who's sick. So you're giving in charity. Why are you giving in charity? All the reasons we do acts of worship are the context for which we are worshipping Allah. So you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, دَاوُوا مَرْضَاكُمْ بِالصَّدَقَةِ Heal your sick through charity. But is that just an instrumental act? I'm going to give charity so I can, you know, for, for my mother. So what is Allah's role in, in the grammar of our worship? Where is Allah in that? It's like that he's just like the the tool for your worship, for your action. You want, you, you, you gave charity because you want your child to be healed. And then you're saying, Allah, heal my child, I did this. That's not how it should be. All the reasons we worship is because Allah is, what do we say about God? God is the one alone worthy of worship. He is worthy of worship. This is a context in which we worship Allah. Right? Why are you fasting in Ramadan? Hmm? Not because it's, it's a month of fasting. Right? At that level actually rationally doesn't make sense. Why is it the month of fasting? Allah said so. So why are you fasting? Act of yeah, but why do you obey Allah? Because He's worthy of worship. So why put that at the end of your, at the end of the sentence? Right? That's like the person who goes, and you know. Jack wants to propose, to you know, wants to marry Jill. And Uncle Jack only has two minutes. So he said. Uncle Bill, you guys are a good family and I really respect you and Uncle Bill knows you don't because you guys pray in the same masjid and you've always, you're part of the other, you know, you ran against him for the masjid board and he won't ever forgive you anyways. And you go on and on and on and you forget to propose to Jill, which is the whole point of the whole meeting. And sometimes, somehow you hope that if you say enough nice things, maybe Uncle Bill will accept. No. The point of worship is the one worshipped, which, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ We only feed you for Allah Himself. وَيُطْعِمُونَ okay. الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ And they feed others out of love for Him. Miskina wa yatima wa asira, the needy, and the, and the orphan, and the prisoner. Okay. 
and throughout the Quran. All the acts of worship. Why are you making dhikr? Why are you sending salah on the Prophet on Friday? Because it's good to do it on Friday. Why? The Prophet said so. So why? And if you keep digging, you say, oh, for the sake of Allah. But that's like a distant afterthought. So don't make Allah a distant afterthought in your worship. Put Allah first. Simple. That's Tawheed. That's pure Tawheed. That's sincerity in Tawheed. Lillahi dinul khalis. For Allah alone is pure religion. Allah is merciful. He accepts other things too. Alhamdulillah. Right? That applies to our all our acts of devotion. Why are you reciting Quran? The answer to all the why questions should be Allah. That's it. Why are you memorizing Quran? There's great reward in it. So what? Not that memorize it anyway. Why are you memorize Quran? For Allah. Because Allah has promised great reward in it. So this is a means of being closer to Allah. Don't make Allah accidental in your worship. Make Allah the object of your worship and the subject of your worship, right? Okay. So that is how we turn to Allah by the name of Allah in our worship. But the same thing applies to our work. Why do you work? Why do you marry? Why are you married? Now, you don't have to be sincere in your, in your worldly life. You could just, I could start a used computer business just to outcompete an old friend. That's foolish. Right? But it's not sinful. On the day of judgment, I won't be asked why they want to outcompete someone else. But what is the opportunity in it that you make that? Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. What does Sayyidina Ibrahim say? Qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi Rabbil Alameen. Say, my prayer and my devotion, my living and my dying, meaning it's my whole, why I lived all my life till my death. Lillahi Rabbil Alameen are for Allah alone. The Lord of the universe. That, that is what I was truly commanded. So that is just a little bit about turning to Allah by the name Allah. Now realizing that and being characterized by that, some of the scholars said that how can you be characterized? Takhalluq. Imam Zarruq says that you can be characterized by all the meanings of all the divine names except the divine name Allah. Because that is about divinity and absolute perfection. And you have no share of divinity and no share of absolute perfection. Rather, the only way you can be characterized by the divine name Allah is to be a true servant of God. That's why some of the early Muslims, and it's said to be Yahya bin Mu'adh al-Razi said, Man arafa nafsahu arafa rabbahu. Whoever knows themselves, knows their Lord. That's not a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, by the way, though it is such a wise statement and so deeply inspired from the Qur'an that some people thought it was, some people thought it was Qur'an. But... Whoever knows themselves, knows their Lord. Whoever knows themselves as being created, needy, dependent, knows their Lord as being eternal, free of all need, absolute, and worthy of all praise. Right? But we can also flip it. And it's, imp it's an important flip in our times. That whoever knows their Lord knows themselves. That only one who knows their Lord knows themselves. Everybody is talking about identity because everybody is lost. Except, rarely, except people of faith, of living faith. Who am I? That's why people come up with the strangest identities. Okay. Okay. 
<laughs> not to make it comic, there's someone who's unemployed and, you know, living in an inner city area and poor, said, I identify as, as a rich white man <laughs> who lives in that mansion. That's not, you know, right? And that's because they're caught stealing. And they said, no, but I have lots, of, I identify as having lots of money. But who, what is your identity? We know very clearly that the identity of existence is, all of existence is a abd of Allah. All of existence is a abd, is an utter need of God. Why? Because God has, God is the creator and sustainer of all that exists. And Allah tells us in the Quran. So what is this cup? It is existentially in slavehood to Allah. What is its slavehood? It is created and sustained by Allah. It is dependent and needy on Allah. So is everything else. Who am I? I am a morally responsible slave of Allah. I, I too am created and dependent. But Allah has given me the subtle reality of choice through being grifted an intellect. And I'm honored by being able to, to make moral choices. So that's how we realize you know, be, you know, are being characterized by this name. And the realization of it, the, what's called the tahakkuk, being realized in the reality of this meaning, right, is that if you know who Allah is, then you would make your choices in life according to the command and pleasure of Allah. Right? That is being realized in the reality. If you know who is God, then that realization should lead one, Imam Zarruq says, to drop caprice and whim. That you don't do things just because. That if you know who is God, then He is worthy of seeking. If you know that I am a servant of God, how do you make your choices? Either in the circle of what is acceptable to Allah, or in the circle of what is pleasing to Allah, or in the circle of what is beloved to Allah. Because that is, because I realize, who am I? Who is my Lord? And what am I? What am I supposed to be doing here? You realize that? What you leave aside is your whim. Just because. And even one's whims and one's desires, one subsumes in seeking Allah. You do it not just out of mere whim. You had a thought that, oh, I saw that there is a... some, some strange fusion dish that they had Nihari tacos. So why are you going to have them? Just because, no. Even those, why the opportunity of being a servant of God is you choose to have the Nihari taco. Why? For Allah. How? Out of gratitude. Out of, out of faith. It is a blessing that Allah has blessed you with, that He has granted you the means and the ability and the, and, and the, the, the funds, etc. But you say, okay, I'll try out the Nihari tacos, I'll take my friend. So Jill takes Zubaida. Jill never married Jack and Zubaida never married Zubair. They're both kind of sad. So they go and they have the Nihari tacos and they intend it. But it's not about Jill and it's not about the taco. It's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, these are contexts. Life is excuses to seek Allah, basically. Life is excuses to seek Allah. Right? Which is why knowing who Allah is entails love of Allah, according to Imam Zarruq. 
right? That realizing who God is entails leaving one's caprice, one's whims, just because. No. It's for lillahi rabbil alameen. Can you put for Allah, I am doing this? And that should be the grammar. It's not I am doing it for Allah. But for Allah, I'm doing this and that. Like all worldly things can fit in that framework. For Allah. And number two, that entails love of Allah. Because what is love? Love goes back to two realities. Love is inclination and choice. If you really love shawarma, you incline towards it. And when you have a choice what to eat, you choose it. What else is love? Right? It's a strong inclination right? and a choice. So if you know who Allah is, you would incline to Him and choose Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So that's how you are realized in the divine name, Allah, right? as a servant of Allah. Right? But that requires certain things. That requires certain things. Imam Junaid al-Baghdadi was asked, how can we truly be devoted to Allah? How can we be truly devoted to Allah? So he said, through repentance that erases continual sinning. Through repentance that erases continual sinning. Because there's sincere repentance when you repent. So he says, by, by an act of repenting that erases continually falling into the sin. Right? Because if you say you're truly devoted to Allah, then you remove the things in your life that cause you to turn away from Allah. That's what a sin is. A sin is an act of turning away from Allah. In a, in a truly, de, in an eternally detrimental manner. So you identify what is it that leads to the sin, and you get rid of that in your life, and that may require consultation if it's not easy. And he said, and an awe of Allah that removes putting things off. An awe of Allah, khawf, khawf is reverential awe. Okay? An awe of Allah that. Causes you to leave putting things off. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the question, أَلَمْ يَأْنِي لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِلَّهِ Afwan. أَلَمْ يَأْنِي لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Has the time not come for hearts to be humbled to the remembrance of Allah? Has the time not come? Is, it, is now not the time to do so? Right? And he says, and hope that drives one to the ways of action. So fear or awe of Allah that causes you to leave putting things off. And hope that drives you to act. Because the hope is in Allah. Hope is in Allah. And to look down on yourself right, by realizing that your, the end of your life is near. And looking down on yourself, yourself is your blameworthy qualities. Right? Right? Because there are two notions of the self. There is a delusionary notion of the self that I am me. That you are the sum of your desires and whims and choices and, and emotions and spiritual inclinations, you are a big mess. If that's, how you are, that's how you define yourself, then you're a mess. Okay? But that's not you. The classical notion of the human being is that the human being is an, is an honored servant of Allah. Who are you? You are a rational animal. 
Allah has ennobled you with an intellect, with a spiritual heart and with a soul. But you have desires and whims. You have emotions. And the role and your honor as a human being is that you make choices that are sound, that are pleasing to Allah, that are beloved to Allah. And then you channel your desires and whims and emotions towards the pleasure of Allah. But you are not your desires. You are not your whims. You are not your emotions. But rather you channel those towards the pleasure of Allah. And beneficial knowledge is that which enables you to turn to Allah in your life. And then he closed by saying, so how do we realize this meaning? He said, with a heart that has a singular purpose in which there is true affirmation of divine oneness. How do you reach these meanings? By a heart that is, has a single purpose. If you are asked what's up, there should only be one answer. Which is, what should be the answer to what's up? Allah, very simple. Eh? What's going on? Allah. Eh? That's why what, there's, there's this work by, about the great spiritual masters of Central Asia. And it mentions there's one person that people used to go for, for spiritual guidance and he used to get free labor out of them because he used to get them to weave carpets with him and he wouldn't teach them anything there's only one test that through the day they'd be weaving carpets at some point he would just hit the table and you would just assess yourself and what was the assessment what are you thinking about and there's this one right response which is Allah. Right? And that's the, that's the description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? The one who perfectly called upon Allah. Okay? That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Sayyidina Aisha kana Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yadhkurullah ala kulli ahyanihi. The Messenger of Allah would be in remembrance of Allah in all his states. Whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, he did in and out of remembrance of Allah. That's what made his worship unimaginably beautiful, his character unimaginably beautiful, because it wasn't about himself, it wasn't about what he was doing, it was about Allah. It made his character beautiful, because it wasn't about how the other person dealt with him, it was about Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is, and of course, when we call upon Allah, right, we have to, bring to mind some of these meanings. When we, say, when we say Allahumma, for example, in dua, what does it mean? It means, Ya Allah, O oh Allah. So you bring to mind some of these meanings of who is Allah? Who am I calling upon? That's why it's better to make fewer duas, but with greater focus. Like when you make dua, make dua a deliberate act. That pause, bring to mind the meaning of what you're going to ask, and then ask. Okay. Even within the prayer, we say, Allahumma anta salam. After, after prayer, Oh Allah, anta salam. You are the peace. Okay. So you bring to mind these meanings, right? Think about the greatness of Allah when you mention the name Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And like Allahumma, and what predominates is the absolute majesty of Allah. Rabb, we'll see when we come to the name Rabb, is one of the names of mercy. Right? You, you bring to mind the mercy and caring of Allah. Right? Allah is the name of majesty. And we realize our neediness when we say Allahumma. Right? Inni asaluka hubbak. Oh Allah. I ask you for your love. That's one of the prophetic du'as. 
you think of the greatness of Allah and your neediness as opposed to when when we say Rabb right it is we recognize Allah's mercy and care and our longing for Allah and for his mercy so that's a little bit of what could be mentioned about the divine name Allah and how we connect to it bi'ithnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala we'll continue next week by looking at the divine names ar-rahman ar-rahim and and on from there we'll we'll stop here for today any questions before we close go ahead No, so habits are very important, but they're also very dangerous. Right? One of the the one of the great one of the great problems one can have in one's acts of worship is that one's worship become mere habits. Right? That one of the greatest harms of worship that become a mere habit. Right? Because worship, the reality of worship is the state of your heart in it. But what you do is it's, you have to establish habits, but you turn to Allah before the habit, number one. Number two, you keep renewing your intention for why you have the habit. So don't just keep a routine of Quran for the Quran, but you have an encompassing purpose in life. I am seeking Allah. My habits, my routines are how I am seeking Allah. So when you set your routine in general, when you review your routine on a weekly basis, or at the end of the day, you review what are you doing for the sake of Allah. Beginning of the day, you renew your intention. Imam Ghazali mentions one of the sunnahs of Fajr is after you pray Fajr, you make dhikr, dua, you reflect, and you set your intentions for the day. You make your commitments. But why? Not just to set the routines, because it's not about the routine, it's about Allah. It's about Allah. Right? That's why the very definition of spirituality, according to Imam Ahmad Zarruq, is Sidq tawajjuhi ilallah. It's to truly turn to Allah fima amar in what He commands you. In the ways that are pleasing to Him. But why are you doing what's pleasing to Him? Allah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for steadfastness and success. Turning to Allah requires that you know yourself. True, but knowing yourself is something that is cultivated. It's like a two-way relationship, right? right? That sometimes, because truly knowing yourself is only possible, but knowing yourself meaning knowing your reality, not knowing yourself as well, because there's all these things, we all affirm all these, right? Your, your emotions, your whims, your desires, your, your feelings, your fears, all these different things, and your inclinations, etc., your choices. All of that is a confusing mess unless you know who your Lord is. Then you know where everything else fits in your life, right? What counts and what doesn't. Right? Okay. So that's why, what is self-awareness, right? Imam Abu Hanifa defined understanding, fiqh, as being to know oneself insofar as what counts for you and what counts against you. That is true self-awareness, is understanding yourself, right? So his definition of what is fiqh, understanding, is ma'rifatu nafs, to know oneself, Malaha wa ma'alihi, insofar as what is for you ultimately and what is against you. Right? right? Because just as you know, if you're at if you're at work and there's a deadline, then you realize that um, there's this, you know, the Nihari taco place, you won't leave your work to go for that. Why? Because you know you have a purpose, right? So you only know yourself 
by knowing your purpose. So if you do some action and you find some satisfaction in it, some joy in it, that's like snacks, right? Snacks. They're not the meal, right? And the meal is worth it even if there aren't snacks. If you go to a really good steakhouse and the steak is amazing, now... You may not have the snacks. Why? Because it's not. That's not what you're there for, right? So a true, you know, like you have a deadline. You say, you know what? I don't really feel it right now, and you miss the deadline. You wouldn't retain your job too long if you work according to your feelings, especially if they're deadlines. So we have a deadline in life, and it's unknown when it is. Okay? So you have to. So. Allah, part of Allah's mercy, especially in the beginning of our turning to Him, we find in some of our acts of worship, certainly, some, some benefit, some peace, some serenity. But none of that is why we pray. And actually, one of the tests that Allah takes in life, He takes that away. Because sincerity is not about doing it for the feeling, for the buzz, the upliftment. But sincer sincerity is to show up, even if you don't feel it. Because he deserves it. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, one of the best of works is what? Is to perform wudu completely when it's dislikable. It's, for example, when the water is cold or you're tired, etc. But isbaghu al-wudu al makari To do the wudu completely. You know, properly. Even when it's dislikable. Because you're not doing it for the feeling that I feel so good when I do wudu. And of course, the feelings, that's part of Allah's mercy, that He's facilitated, but we would do it regardless. And sometimes you have to fake it, that you don't feel it. And that's where it is helped by turning to Allah first, inwardly, before one turns to Allah outwardly, for example, by saying Allahu Akbar, or before you start your wudu, or anything else. Because that helps put things in perspective. The other way to stir our heart, rather than our feelings, they say is, when you turn to Allah, bring to mind that you're doing it for the love of Allah, or out of gratitude to Allah, or out of awe for Allah, of Allah, or out of hope, or out of the lordship of Allah, or out of slavehood to Allah. These, ki these kinds of meanings help turn us towards Allah. Right? And those are the, the true, em the spiritual emotions are the true emotions. That was so enjoyable. Those are fickle emotions. And they're, they're like, you know, the, the snacks, right? But the snacks are dangerous, right? Because it was enjoyable. What if it wasn't enjoyable? Right? Some people who struggle all, all their life. They're, you know, certain societies, recitation is a lot more difficult. Or you just have a really bad voice. Every time you recite the Quran, you're like, oh my goodness. That was so tough. But it's not about whether it felt joyous or not. No, so what if you give charity for some worldly outcome? Allah is merciful, right? And that is considered one level of sincerity. Because there's three levels of sincerity. The lowest sincerity is to ask Allah for some worldly reason. That's still sincerity. And Allah loves to be asked. He loves even that. You gave in charity. Asking Allah to heal your, your friend, for example. That's still sincerity. But it's a lower level sincerity. Intermediate sincerity is to, is to do something for Allah seeking Reward in the next life. That's mid-level sincerity. High sincerity, as is clear throughout the Quran, is to do it for the sake of Allah Himself. Iyaka na'bud. It is you alone we are humbly devoted to.
Yeah, of course. Right? So, if your child is sick, for example, doesn't mean you don't give a charity. It's sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But we do it. I'm seeking Allah by giving charity to heal my sick child. It's just a shift in perspective. Right? Surah, you, let's say reciting Surah Al-Mulk at night because it's protection and so on. Why are you reciting it? You're trying just for the protection. It's a good deed. And it's sincere. It's better than the one who didn't do it. Right? But higher than that is to recite it, seeking reward in the next life. But the, you know, the, the prophetic standard is to do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Muslims were digging the trench, the Prophet وسلم, and the, taught the Sahaba to, 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 to say, Allahumma lawla anta mahtadayna. O oh Allah, were it not for you, we would not have been guided. Wala tasaddaqna. We would not have given, were, were it not for you, we would not have given in charity. Wala sallayna. And we would not have prayed. Because in reality, religion makes no sense without God. Make no sense. Like, why would you get up in the middle of, why would you disturb your sleep? Why would you interrupt your work? Why would you, you know, do all these things? The point is Allah, right? Lillahi dinul khalis. For Allah is pure religion. Okay. So we'll stop there. Bismillah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So we'll be starting the seminar at, at about 2.05 inshallah.